Hello, and thank you for watching this presentation by the American Iron Society. Please support the organization by becoming a member. Go to irises.org and click on Join. Thank you. So, hello, hello everybody. Uh, it's an honor to see so many people who are interested in nature and in uh, in plants, in gardening, and uh, it's uh, it's really an honor to see all of you. Um, I uh, the talk today would be on the irises of um, of the of Israel where I live, but uh, will be um, also um, uh, will will cross the borders into Jordan, even into Syria, although I haven't been there yet, um, but also a bit further on because I couldn't resist. Um, but you see the irises, you know how beautiful they are. And just as an introduction, I would just like to show you the, the corner of the world where we live. This is Israel and the, and the Palestinian areas and Jordan and Egypt. And you can see that the, the country is more or less half Mediterranean and half desert. The line that divides them is between 200 and 400 millimeters of rain, average rainfall. Um, and, uh, and the flora goes uh, accordingly. Half of the country has a Mediterranean flora. And then we have something we call a transition zone between the Mediterranean and the Sahara Arabian or desert area. And then the rest of the country has um, a desert flora. Um, but when we talk about irises, the irises, and in general, I would say geophytes and barbs um, will be distributed in the Mediterranean transition and semi-desert. Uh, so in this, uh, in this area, I go back a bit. So no irises in the extreme desert, but there will be above, um, above 70 millimeters average rainfall, you'll get barbs and irises included uh, and are uh, uh, distributed in these, uh, in these areas. Um, the, the most you know, interesting and most striking <clears throat> irises, and I would say in general flowers, in our region are the Oncocyclus um, uh, irises. Um, and um, we have about eight or nine, depends who, who you talk with, um, species in our region. And these magnificent flowers have a lot, a lot of things that are uh, exciting. Uh, there is a special, there is a big group that doing research on them in the Tel Aviv University, uh, led by uh, Dr. Yuval Sapir, my good friend. And, um, and that, that, that checking, he, he was doing research on them for, for decades. But I, I would like even to go back into the 1970s and 1980s, uh, 40 or 50 years ago, when we saw these beautiful flowers in the field. And the flowers, if you look at my hands, are about this size. You know the onkos, maybe most of you. And um, this big flower is standing in the field. There is no nectar produced in the flower. There is very little pollen um, uh, produced in the flower. And, uh, and for years, we were thinking, what the hell? Who is pollinating these flowers? There, we saw no pollinator at all. Ignore the, the picture on the right for, the, for a second. And um, it took years until, uh, until a, a, a teacher in the north of the country said, uh, this, is, this is impossible. His name was uh, uh, Yariv Ivri. And he said, it's impossible. Somebody is pollinating these flowers because they are self-incompatible. They are producing fruits. So somebody is pollinating them. It's just catching who, who it is. So he said, I'm going to sit here for 24 hours and I'll see who is pollinating them. And on the first night, he sat with the iris as he realized that the flowers, these dark, especially dark, but not only dark flowers, are filled with male solitary bees <clears throat> which stay in the flower and leave early in the morning uh, out. So the, the reward in this, in the case of the Uncle Cyclos Iris is, is not food reward, but it's accommodation, or if you want a, a, a bee hotel or a male bee hotel. Uh, and then Yuval Sapir uh, did his master's and PhD on them. And he, 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 if he was asking other questions. He said, Who is, why staying in the flower? Why to stay in the flower? <clears throat> Most solitary bees are staying in cracks in the, in the soil. And then he started measuring the temperature. He said, OK, maybe the, the dark flowers are heated uh, more quickly. So maybe you get not only accommodation, but free heating. And then he, he didn't find any, any differences in temperature between the soil and the flowers. But 
uh, when he continued his research, he found that early in the morning, these, these flowers are getting heated more quickly than the soil. So the bees that are staying in the flowers are, can go out of this, uh, this flower earlier than other bees that are staying in the, in the frozen, not frozen, but in the colder soil, and then they can reach uh, uh, nectar producing or food rewarding other flowers. So from, from, from just the beautiful flowers, you hear a, an exciting pollination ecological story, which is continuing now into genetics, which uh, this group is doing in the Tel Aviv University. I'll say a little bit more about them. On the right side, you can see Iris Heine. And um, I was lucky enough, I would say that probably almost 30 years ago, that I scanned um, a slide, uh, to reach Iris Heine in the north of the country. And it was a very cloudy day. And then um, the, the irises were almost gone. There were only two flowers in the field. And I was sitting frustrating because I was guiding a group of Japanese at that time. And, um, and as I was sitting, this bee came out of the flowers full of pollen on its back and just showing, you know, onco oncocyclos pollination, which is exciting and a rare event. So I, at that point, I finished probably almost the whole film just taking picture of this a single bee with the, with the pollen on its back. So there are, in irises, there are what we call the pollination tunnels. So there are tunnels, you can see in the, in the central flower, there is a patch, uh, or in the left, uh, in the left uh, picture, there is a patch, uh, and the bees learn very quickly to go to the patch and to enter this place and just stay there in the night and leave, um, and leave later in the morning. In the 1970s, Dr. Michael Avishai, my predecessor in the garden, um, uh, did a PhD on these irises. And he, he grew not only these uh, three irises, but he grew, um, um, uh, I think, 40 species uh, all around its range. This is a map that he, uh, that he did uh, in his PhD. And he started growing them all in Jerusalem. And he started hybridizing them. And he got fertile hybrids from all of them. So obviously, this is a, these, these are a very closely related species that is a young, evolving group. And, um, and some people would say, oh, these botanists, they, are, they want all these names. This is one widespread species with coliforms uh, along its range. Um, but it, anyway, whatever you think about this group, it's, it's very interesting and, uh, and uh, exciting. Um, so um, these irises, at least in, in our country, um, live in a, a grow in, in the eastern part in the most in semi-arid situation. <clears throat> so they get little rainfall, but substantial rainfall <clears throat> in, in only along three months. In, from December to February, we get 80% of our um, precipitation. So they get quite a lot of water in a very short period of time. And the, the, the largest mistake people are doing with these uh, oncos when they grow them in gardens is over irrigation. And especially if you irrigate them beyond these months, uh, you'll get them rotting very, very quickly and very, uh, and very easily. So I probably most of you know that what are oncocyclus irises? They are rhizomatous plants, they are forming clumps, they have a single flower and a birded fall and a flag lock. Uh, upper upper perian sediment, and here you have a map showing all the species uh, that uh, that we have in, in our region. My my uh, friend, Greek friend Nikos, uh, made a very nice map with pictures of them, and you can see also the patches on the map showing the distribution of these irises in nature. And whatever species you are looking at, you'll see that it is not a continuous distribution but it is kind of uh, dis disjunctive. So uh, there is a population and then perhaps 10 miles, there is nothing. And then there is another population. Each population have hundreds of clumps, maybe 1000 clumps, something like that, but they are not continuous. And the feeling you have when you go in the countryside is that there are potential habitats, but they are not really, uh, um, they are not really uh, uh, used by the irises, so to say. Um, and this has to do probably with the seed dist distribution dispersal of these irises. The seeds um, uh, have this area, aril, uh, that is um, uh, collected by the, by the ants, and the ants are distributing the seeds. And the ants, you know, are distributing the seeds 
very close by, so a few meters, maybe 10, 20 meters, not more than that. So as, uh, when a clump is established, the seeds will, dis will be distributed around it, and then you'll get this population of a few dozens, few hundred, maybe 1,000 plants. But to get these 10 miles to the new population, that's a very rare event. And this is happening maybe, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just guessing once every 30,000 years. And it's a rare event. And if, uh, if the, in this rare event, this seed is germinating, establishing, forming a clump, then after that, perhaps the new population will be, uh, will be established. It's very interesting to show, to, to, to see this kind of pattern of distribution of this group of, of plants, which is, um, which is not similar in many other uh, irises and many other um, uh, plants in, in uh, general. So here you can see again the uh, the iris hyena, which which grows and um, um, uh, in Mount Gilboa. The, the common name is Mount Gilboa iris. is a mountain in the northeast of the country, and um, you see it says it has 58 sites. So these are data that comes from uh, our red data book, and uh, 58 sites means 58 square kilometers on the world, on on the on the map, and you see that only 20% of them are in nature reserve, and it's a vulnerable uh, um, uh, species. And according to the Israel Red Number, which is our local endangered nest system, it is uh, it is uh, endangered. Uh, if you look at this flower, and this is probably one of the most magnificent ones, it's 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 a really huge huge. A, a flower, uh, but you can see a variety of, of colors. It's usually dark violet, um, but uh, or purple. But you can see, you know, all kind of uh, of other uh, um, um, colors. And the veining, and you know, you can sit in front of this iris and just adore, you know, the beauty of nature in a single flower. You don't have to do anything. And I suppose many people will understand what I'm talking about. Um, as you go to the south, iris uh, hyena becomes smaller and darker. And this is what we call Artrofusca. Now, it depends whom you are asking. In my view, this species is not a good species, but it's changing gradually into a desert or a semi-desert uh, species, which we call Artrofusca. And this grows in, in the transition zone between the Mediterranean and the desert, but also in the, in the semi-desert itself. And it has 44 sites um, you can see also here all kind of color forms you can see here the habitat so it might be a plain with a dust like marley soil which is very miserable soil i would say and then you take this iris as you put it in a garden with uh, with a proper mix and you over irrigate it and you get it rotten in a few weeks so the thing is the best, pla the best places where people uh, were succeeding in cultivating doncocycles is when they left them alone. So they forgot them in a corner when they forgot to irrigate them and over there they, they, they did the best. So the, the, my, best, my, my first tip would be irrigate much less, uh, very good drainage and just forget about them. Don't treat them, don't fertilize them definitely and just let them be. And um, and. Interestingly, irises and I would say in general geophytes in our region are not picky in, the so in their soil type. So these Atrofusca iris will grow in uh, volcanic soil, in, in limestone, in this marley soil, in all kinds of soils. They are not picky about the soil type, but they are very picky about drainage and about water you know, availability. Um, uh, in peak bloom, uh, the Irish sites of, uh, of our region are places of, of pilgrimage. So a lot of people, they are on the news when they are in peak bloom, and a lot of people in the weekends are just, you know, coming and, and just walking and enjoying uh, uh, this fantastic bloom. And here you can see Atrofusca in the northern Negev Desert, which is in the south part of the country. And in a good rainy year, you know, it's fluctuating in the desert. Uh, you get hundreds and hundreds of clumps together in peak bloom, and that's an event, and people enjoy it. And if it's a good year, you'll see all kinds of other flowers. Like this. you can see here, Flomoides, which is this, uh, from the sage family, and you can see all kinds of other bulbs, tulips, whatever you can think of. They're all found there um, in that region. Now, the, this semi-arid region is is um, endangered. 
And I would say in general that, uh, that all the irises, all the Somcocytosiruses are endangered primarily because of habitat loss. And we think about habitat loss, about urban uh, expansions or about agriculture use, but here is another one. So this is, uh, you, you, you wouldn't have guessed, but this is a planted forest. So planted forest, afforestation is another threat for the, uh, for the irises. And here you can see um, a prosopis, a uh, prosopis, probably alba, that comes from America that is planted by our uh, afforestation um, uh, institution. And that's another threat of the irises which grow in the same, uh, you know, nearby. Um, in Atrofusca, in all the Oncocyclus irises, you can see color from. So there is a potential for cultivation. You can see here a yellow color from and a pinkish color from. So there is, there, there is a variety, a genetic variety in the field, which is very, um, um, very exciting. Now, we, um, when, we, when you see them in the sunset, this is really red wine, you know, color. The, this, this is really fantastic. And when you see this clump, you would say, oh, this is what I want in my garden. I want the clump of irises like that. I don't care if they bloom only two weeks in the, in the year, but this is what I want to see in my garden. Now, that's a challenge to reach such a, such a beauty in your garden. I don't know, but very few gardens have this, uh, this kind of uh, clumps that are blooming nicely year after year. And again, Less irrigation is, is, the, is the first thing to do. Uh, we are struggling also in Jerusalem, in, in Jerusalem Botanical Gardens, where I work, uh, we are struggling to grow them because we have a lot of them that are infested by viruses that come from uh, Dutch bulbs. Uh, and the, most of the Dutch bulbs don't care about these viruses, but these irises, it's, they, they are like magnets to these viruses. And very soon you have this coloration on the foliage and on the flowers, and there is nothing you can do. It's, it's, you have to throw uh, away um, um, the plants in order not to infest other, uh, other plants. So we grow these irises in buckets, but also in the garden. And we have, I would say, small success. So I would say, because this, these are very endangered species, I would say, don't collect them in nature at all. Just try to pro propagate them as much as you can from collections in cultivation and do your best. And what we can do is very little, I'm afraid, with this, uh, with this group. Now, these iris, which was called till probably two, two weeks ago, Iris Petrana, and, and now we call it Iris Affinis Petrana, which is similar to the real Petrana, which I'll show you later, has only 20, 22 sites also in the, in the semi-desert. Um, but I want to show you, and if you look at this clump, there are two clumps here, and there are two color forms just here. And if I'm talking about color uh, uh, variation, this is the most variable color. Um, uh, colored species in our region. The question is whether this is a good species or not. And um, uh, already years ago, Michael Avishai uh, postulated that this might be a hybrid population that, that shows all these colors. And you can see the unbelievable colors that you see in one population. And uh, now the, the first genetic results from Yuval Sapir, I'm not sure if he allows me to say, but I'll say it anymore. Anyway, he's my friend. Uh, he said that, uh, that it, his genetic data supports that this is a hybrid population between two other species that are growing uh, nearby. Now, this is the real Irish Petrana that was described from South Jordan near the city, the ancient city of Petra. And, um, this blooms a bit later in higher altitudes. So I would say all the irises I've shown you till now are blooming in March, and this will bloom in April, so a couple of weeks, uh, a couple of, of weeks later. But if you look at this flower and you go back to these flowers and you go back to iris uh, um, atrofusca or a dark um, iris hyena, they are very, very similar. The minor changes, Iris Heine and Iris Atrofusca are scented, and the rest are not scented. Um, but morphologically, there are minor differences between these, these, uh, these species. And what um, Yuval Sapir found in his research is that the evolution has nothing to do with color of the flower. So we used to, to lump together, and you can see also even my talk is arranged like this. We lump together the group, the dark ones, the dotted ones, and I don't know, the, the bright ones. But uh, it doesn't happen, um, and, and genetically, they are not sorted 
um, in, this, uh, in this order. As you go north in Jordan, you can see another one, which is called Iris nigricans, which is probably the black iris, but you can see also that it's not always very black, um, but it's, uh, it's again an exciting, uh, um, exciting um, uh, species. I'm sorry, I don't have time to go through the chat, but I, I promise we will do it. Uh, we will do it a bit later. Uh, so there are probably eight species in Israel, and maybe two or three in Jordan, maybe four. Uh, but a thousand more species is, at least in my view, the most beautiful species is Iris Maria. So the, it, I'm sure each one of you has it, its best iris. So my best iris is Iris Maria. It's, it, it, its color is it's the most magnificent, I don't know, violet pink, I don't know how to describe it. It's a bit darkish, brownish on the lower part, but more violet on the upper part. It has 45 sites, but uh, I didn't update this, uh, uh, this presentation. We found recently more than 100 sites in the Western Negev, in the Western Desert, in the sandy habitats, and this continues into Northern Sinai in Egypt. Now, a plant that has more than 100 sites is not considered as an endangered species in, uh, in Israel. So we don't consider this one um, endangered anymore because we found it in many places, but there are problems because it is decreasing. Uh, there is overgrazing by goats and, uh, and a lot of army activities in this area, you know, training, tanks, things like that. Uh, so um, this, the, the plant is really decreasing, but it's not re it's not endangered um, um, uh, at, the, at present. Here you can see the habitat, which is a kind of a sandy plain, uh, full of these irises, but it's full of with asphodels. These are the, the slender um, uh, leaves over here. A lot of annuals are blooming in a good year. You can see lots of them. And um, and one thing that is very obvious about the irises, but in all the other bulbs, is that in a dry year, the first thing they don't do is they don't bloom. So if it's a dryish year with little rainfall, they'll produce a few leaves and will not, not do more than that. But in a good year, they will bloom and most of them will bloom. So the, it's fluctuating according to the rainfall and in good years, then you'll have loads of them and, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a celebration of nature. Like happened this year where uh, we had a lot of rain in the desert and a lot of these irises were, uh, were blooming. And when you have irises, you have other flies, you can see here tulips, wild desert tulips, uh, and other bulbs that are blooming nearby. What is uh, one character that is very prominent in the Iris Maria is the falcate leaves. So it has very narrow leaves. It's uh, probably the narrowest or almost the narrowest in the in this group. And um, um, this has to do with the adaptation to the desert because this grows in the most arid situation. So if you have smaller leaves, you lose less water and that's the, and that's the thing. Uh, here you can see grazing of, uh, of Iris Maria, grazing by goat. Um, some, in, in some places, these irises remained in semi-disturbed situations. So this is a fallow field. <laughs> it used to be cultivated, but it's not cultivated anymore. So you have all these brassicaceae uh, flowers around them. Uh, but the iris survived in this situation, especially if it was uh, traditionally managed agriculture, which means shallow plowing, and no herbicides used. Um, uh, so these irises are in, 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 in semi-disturbed uh, areas. Uh, and also here we have a few um, color uh, forms. Uh, what is very prominent about this iris is the black patch, but also the black bird. Uh, the bird, the bird in, in the others are yellowish. And here it's very dark. So this species is very, very unique in its uh, in its color and mostly would look like the flowers you can see here um, um, on the left. Uh, now, when we grew this Iris Maria with the falcated leaves in Jerusalem, you can see the picture on the left with our buckets. The leaves are not falcate anymore; they are erect. So, when the, the, this uh, this character is affected by the climate, and if you take a desert plant in the Mediterranean situation, then it has uh, erect leaves. So this is probably not a genetic uh, uh, trait. Um, the most easy, I would say, species to grow from the Oncocycrus group is Iris atropoprua, which is a coastal Mediterranean plant. Now, I would like to say about this group, the, the Oncocycrus irises, they are Iran-Mediterranean. So they are, uh, the, the, 
their center is, I would say, Jordan, Syria, uh, also Israel, but going to Iran, that area, which is called cold desert, uh, cold arid, semi-desert, steppes, things like that. Uh, and a few species are penetrating into real Mediterranean. And one of them is Iris atropurpurea, which grows in the Mediterranean, but it grows in sandy situations. So the sand is a more arid um, um, habitat, and that's why uh, it can grow. It, it, it feels as if it is in semi-desert, although the precipitation is, is much larger. Now, the picture you see on the left is, is a picture I took in 1980, I don't know, seven. Uh, so you can calculate how many years, 35 or something years ago. And when I looked, at, I, I scanned uh, the slides recently. And when I look at the slide, I wrote uh, the location. And the location, unfortunately, uh, is gone. So today, this population is under a highway. And this is what is happening with more, many population of this, this beautiful iris that grows on the coastline where most of us live. And uh, I would say in general that Israel is becoming a very, very dense country. So there are 14 million people living here from Jordan River to the Mediterranean. Let's leave politics out for a second. And uh, we are probably the Hong Kong of the Middle East. So a very tiny country with a lot of people living in it. And in this situation, the, the, the nature is, is shrunk into islands, which we call nature reserves today. And some of these nature reserves are really, really small, especially in the case of this uh, Iris atropurpurea. So you can see here another population of this dark one, and you can see agriculture areas and the background around here. So, but there are some magnificent clumps, like you see this clump. I don't know if you've counted, I'm sure Andy already counted. So there are 127 flowers here. And um, um, how old is this clump? I would say that it is at least 50 years old, but maybe it's 250 years old. So we don't know. Uh, we didn't do enough research on these irises uh, in, uh, in, uh, in nature. And the most, um, uh, I would say, natural habitat of this iris atropurpurea is the white broom shrubland. As you can see here, this is all on sandy loam. Uh, so you can see this white broom, which is a legume uh, shrub, a leafless leg legume shrub. And uh, this is like a magnificent you know, example of the, of the uh, habitat. Um, also here, you, you can see something that we see often in other oncocycles, but if they grow in the sandy soil, you, it's more clear. So you can see a clump that started in the middle and expanded into the periphery in a kind of a circle. So the middle, the older part of the rhizome is gone already. It's rotten or it's thick, so it died long ago. And then the clump continues as a ring that grows and grows and grows uh, in time. And as you can see on the right side, there are also color forms of this species as well. By the way, the other flowers you can see on, on the left is Allium Tel Avivens, uh, that is uh, named after the city where I live, Tel Aviv. Um, and uh, you can see here also a very dark one that, uh, uh, that I found. So these iris, this species grows in Mediterranean land. So in Mediterranean land, there is rainfall every year. So it blooms every year. So in February, you can see it for sure every year in the coastline. Now this plant, uh, Iris bismarckiana, is competing to be one of the most beautiful flowers, not within the irises, but one of the most beautiful flowers in the world, because these huge flowers is half dotted and half more striped, I would say, so half darker and half lighter, is really a, a beautiful plant that grows primarily in the Galilee. It was found recently in two sites in Jordan. It was found recently in a couple of sites in South Lebanon, but most of the populations are located within the Galilee in Israel. And the Galilee is becoming very, very dense with villages and towns and, and agriculture. And it is really losing its, its habitat. So there are only 31 sites. And uh, here you can see uh, the irises at the edge of a planted forest. So there were irises also in the forest, but it, it's too dark for them uh, already and they are gone. Uh, from the forest and remained at the edge um, of the forest. And what is very typical for this iris is that it is forming huge carpets of leaves. 
huge. Sometimes, you know, 30 meters, 30 square meters, 40 square meters of foliage, and they don't bloom. And there is a couple of flowers here and one flower there and from one flower there. And David Shachar, the late David Shachar, who cultivated these flowers, and I will talk about him a bit later, told me that he never used this iris in his hybrids because this reduced the fertility, reduced the flower rate, and he doesn't want this. So this is a very interesting iris. Also genetically, it sits separate uh, from other, uh, from the rest of the Oncocyclos, uh, as you well just told me recently. So here you can see the natural habitat of Iris Bismarckiana, which is a um, <laughs> shrublet land. So it's an area that is dominated by, by shrublets that are small, you know, spiky things. And uh, in this situation, they, they, they thrive. And here you can see the, the flowers, which are so nice, and also the fruit that is produced a bit, uh, a, a, a bit uh, later. So uh, Yuval Sapir, has, you see that his name is, is reappearing in my talk because he's the expert on irises in, in, uh, in Israel. And he did uh, research on this iris uh, with one of his students. Uh, Bosmat Sega, and uh, what they did is they checked the um, the fruit set in the population, and what they did, what they found is the natural fruit fruit set of this population was 13 percent. So 30 percent of the flowers were fruiting. Now they add additional artificial pollination within that population, and the fruit set rose into 44 percent. And in some other areas, they added artificial pollination between populations from, from a neighboring population, and they reached a much higher uh, fruit set. So um, one thing that we are not aware of is that there is probably a lack of pollinators, and there is a pollinator crisis in general. So this is another really um, a, a threat to, uh, uh, to flowers in general and to endangered species in, in specifically and this iris specifically. Uh, so we can really encourage them by just pollinating them. Uh, and this should be probably done uh, in, some, uh, in some areas. Now we are climbing up to the north of the country and this is Mount Hermon, 2000 meters. This is on the border of Syria, Lebanon and Israel. And uh, that's a, uh, fantastic, I would say subalpine area above the tree line. And here you can see Iris Westii that was found by Mike Livne, whom you see in the late way, Mike Livne who found it over there. And this is also a really amazing flower. Now, how, how different it is from Iris Bismarckiana. It doesn't form large clumps. It always forms small clumps and most of the clumps are blooming unlike Iris Bismarckiana. The leaves are falcate and not straight like Iris Bismarckiana. And you can see they are a bit pinkish above, uh, on the bracts below the flower. So there are a few, I would say small characters that are <laughs> separating this, uh, 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 these species. Now these species will bloom in the beginning of May and will bloom for 10 days, that's it. Most of the plants are here, or most of these irises are blooming for a very short period of time. So that's the disadvantage. Also in cultivation, that's the disadvantage uh, of these irises. Here you can see my friends and my wife enjoying these irises, and you can see also the fruits uh, a bit uh, a bit later. The other, the third one, and the last dotted one is Iris Hermona. And interestingly. Iris Westii was found in Mount Hermon, but Iris Hermona is not found in Mount Hermon. Now, Iris Hermona is found in the Golan Heights, which is a volcanic area below Mount Hermon, but at the place where it grows, or the places, there, the area where it grows, the most prominent thing in your landscape is the snowy Mount Hermon, and we believe that's why it was probably named uh, Iris uh, Hermona. And this is becoming really, really endangered. Uh, the sites are really disappearing, and the problem is Primarily, I would say porcupines that are eating the rhizomes, but also cattle grazing. Now, the cattle do not really eat the irises, but they tremble on them, and they are big animals, and that they really destroy the clumps in uh, uh, in, uh, in nature. So uh, this is this has become a really a real problem in this beautiful iris. Now, this one is uh, very similar to the, to, to, the, to the last previous one, but it's even taller and even bigger. So this is probably one of the most striking flowers you can, you can imagine. 
and you can see there are some differences. Now, you can see in the left that this one is, is a bit more dotted on the upper part. And as you go to Lebanon, there'll be other two species or three species that are even more dotted. And this will be named Iris Socianea and in Turkey, Iris Kirkudii, which I'll show you a bit later. So the species are here almost gradually changing one from, from one to the, to the other. The, the other sort of group we, are, we, we, used to, we used to call the pale ones. So Aris Lortetia in our region, which is the largest probably and the last one to bloom. This will bloom in the late April in the lowland. And the, the flowers is really huge flower. Uh, and, uh, and the Turkish Aris Gatesii was <laughs> thought to be related, but now we know it's not really related into this Iris Lortetii. And this grows in the, in the disjunctive situation in East Samaria in the, in the um, uh, Palestinian territories, but also in the upper Galilee within proper Israel. So this is um, uh, disjunctive um, and also endangered. And here you can see it uh, on, the, on the West Bank, uh, you can see that it is growing in this uh, rocky slope. But you can see that most of the area is full with, um, with olive groves that are grown by the local Arabs. And um, it, it's because it is kind of a traditional agriculture, the iris remained at the periphery or at the walls of these terraces that are built uh, in the region. So we, are, we want to encourage very much traditional agriculture. Now that's a problem because if you look at this olive grove, it produced, I don't know how many liters of, of, of olive grove per, uh, per um, hectare, but if you grow olives in a modern grove, you'll get 10 times more olive grove, olive, uh, olive production. So what are we supposed to say to tell the, the farmers? Oh, please remain, remain tradition because you have some beautiful flowers uh, within your groves. Uh, this is, of course, not realistic. So this is kind of the, the, the problems we have uh, locally in our, uh, in our region. And we are trying, you know, with our nails to clink into the last population of these irises and protect them somehow. Here you can see the, the, the same irises in the Eastern Galilee, also in a very rocky um, uh, slope. Um, uh, and of course, they are so beautiful for the ten days when they uh, when they bloom. Each of these flowers will bloom for three, four, sometimes five days, not more than that, which is quite long, but not long enough to to, to uh, for them to be cut flowers. So they they, they cannot last more than uh, more than that. Uh, Yuval Sapir's uh, master's uh, research showed that these irises morphologically are not different from one, one from the other. So you see the overlap in all kinds of character in this graph. So they are not really uh, separate uh, properly. Now the Vichachak, the late Vichachak who lives in the Jordan Valley decided he wants to cultivate them. And uh, as I told you, it's very difficult to cultivate them because they, are, they get these viruses and they don't last. So he started growing them. He made hybrids between the species and he also hybridized them with Iris Germanica. And then he got these things which get the strengths from Iris Germanica, but get, get the flower shape from the Oncocycros irises. I think this one has Iris Germanica, but also Iris Heine and maybe Iris Hermona and maybe Iris Maria. So it has like four parents, this guy over here, which I think is called Iris Moore. That's the name of the, of this variety. And you can see on the right side, the field with, uh, with these irises, they are all sterile. They are propagated only by, by rhizome cuttings and, um, uh, and they are exported uh, all over the world. Uh, and they are grown also locally uh, a little bit. So the, the trick was to hybridize them with Iris Germanica and then get stronger varieties uh, in the in the garden. Unfortunately, David Chahak uh, passed away a few, years, a few years ago, and there is nobody that continues his work of cultivation. So the, the business, I would say, the agriculture business continues, and they sell some of these rhizomes, but nobody is really, you know, doing research and finding new varieties, at least locally in uh, in Israel. I would like to cross the border and uh, and go. To, to Lebanon, to, sorry, to Jordan, but not South Jordan as I did before, but North Jordan. And in North Jordan, in North Jordan there, uh, there is Iris postrensis, which is another dark one, but it has this yellow 
background of the flower. This is the character of this, uh, of this species. This grows in Northern Jordan, in South Syria, uh, a troubled area these days. But if you even cross the border a bit north, uh, even more to the north in Southern Syria, in Jebel Druze, you find this fantastic Iris auranitica. <coughs> uh, these are uh, pictures take, taken by my good German friends, Thomas Fitz, uh, that saw it over there blooming in late May, so really late in altitude of 16 or 1700 meters. So it's a mountainous species that blooms really, really late and it has the most magnificent golden color, uh, Iris auranitica. And if you go uh, into the anti-Lebanon mountains, also in Syria, you get this Iris anti-Lebanotica, which is more violet and may perhaps re resembles a bit more the, the Iris um, Maria or Iris Heine in Israel, again, taken by Thomas Fitz. So um, I couldn't resist, and we we're talking about the Middle East, but I wanted to show you a couple of irises that I saw in Armenia, in the Caucasus, and uh, they also belong to this, to this group. Now, unlike the Oncocycros iris of our region, if you look at the falls here, the falls are um, um, convex. Uh, but in the Caucasus, the falls are concave. You can see they look like maybe balls or whatever. And this is Iris Likotis, which grows in the northern Iran and the southern Caucasus. And I was lucky enough to see it in Armenia. And this is Iris Lineolata, full of these lines and delicate species that is real, rather easy to grow also, and that grows in that region. And, um, and that concludes my 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 talk about the Oncocycros iris. So, um, uh, so you see, you know, we are all into the Oncocycros, but they are so tricky in, uh, in cultivation. With the last, with the remaining time I have, I would like to show you the other irises we have in the region. And they are uh, also very, very exciting, although not so striking. So these are Maria's. Um, uh, Maria is a big genus of South Africa where there are dozens of species, but very few species have crossed uh, from tropical uh, from tropical Africa across the Sahara to the Mediterranean and, and, and speciated uh, uh, in the Mediterranean into two species, Morassis erinchium, the butternut, uh, which is very common in the Mediterranean, and then Morea mediterranea, mediterranea, which has only one leaf, if you look. So uh, uh, Morea erinchium has a couple, has, has a pair of leaves, and this one has only one leaf. How many irises do you know that are one leafed? I don't think you know any. Uh, and how many plants you know are, have only one leaf, perhaps just very, very few. So this is widespread and variable in color. And this is very restricted into <coughs> sandy areas. This actually will grow together with Iris Maria. And most of them are very easy to grow, unlike the Onc Oncocycros. The other group of plants we have uh, in the region is the Iris reticulata group. And, um, and that's another section. Uh, within the genus, and these are uh, charactered by um, a leaf that has a square cross section, which is also very, very unusual in the plant world in general. And the leaf will end up with a kind of a stigma uh, at the end. Um, now, in, in Hebrew, the, this Iris vertania is called <coughs> the ruler's iris because the leaves are just straight like a ruler. And this plant, uh, if you look, this is the map from our red data book, is endemic. There are a couple of more uh, populations in Jordan, but that's all, that's the whole distribution of, of the species. And you can see that they are uh, distributed along the country. There are still quite a few populations of this, uh, of this iris. Now, the funny thing is that Iris, uh, Iris Vartanii is named after Dr. Kalust Vartan, uh, who was an Armenian English doctor who came 150 years ago to the land of Israel, and he built the, uh, the uh, hospital, the English hospital in Nazareth. That was the only hospital available between Damascus and Jerusalem, and he built this hospital, <laughs> and he was kind of uh, hiking around. Uh, he had four kids. All his four kids died of malaria at that time in Israel, which is a terrible story, but he found his iris and didn't know what it was, so he sent it to Kew Gardens, to England, where they grew them, 
and they've described him in his honor, Iris Vartaniai. And I was very happy to, uh, to meet his grand, grand, grandson, who is also a, an MD doctor from England and, uh, and give him some pictures and also some barbs for, of this Iris that were planted in Nazareth near this hospital. So just an interesting story around this Iris. Now, Iris Vartania, you see is a very pale species. It's very easy to grow. I think it's a, it's a very nice cultivar for, uh, for non-hardy areas. So for California, uh, for Australia, for these regions, <laughs> for the, the Mediterranean region, these, in, these, in these areas, you can really grow them. They are fantastic. They're forming nice clumps. Each flower will bloom for a week uh, and uh, they are really easy to grow. Um, as you go to the north of the country, and here you can see the, um, the seedlings of these iris and also the fruits. So we are monitoring all these uh, things and we are doing some research on these irises. But as you go to the north of the country, you'll get something similar, but much more bluer. And people will say probably much more beautiful. And this is iris histrio, which is a northernmost uh, the, uh, is, is a more northern element that is more hardy and probably will, uh, will suit a more European situation in cultivation. This is Iris Histrio, uh, which is more blue and more dotted. And here you can see it in the, on the left, even under the, our rare snowstorms that we have. On the right side, you can see the, um, uh, the calyx, so the, the capsule, which is the fruit. Now the, the fruit, the ovary, when in, in, during blooming, the ovary is underground because it's an inferior ovary. And after fertilization, it will take quite a few weeks, if not months, until the ovary is inflated into a capsule and migrate up above ground. It takes time. So it's very interesting about these uh, winter blooming irises. I, I forgot to say that was winter blooming. Um, um, Uh, the other uh, the other iris we have is uh, if I wouldn't put the name I would pro probably some people say ah oh, this is Iris pallida this is Iris sicula <coughs> this is Iris germanica maybe somebody would say so this belongs of course to this Iris germanica group and this is called locally Iris mesopotamica which is a beautiful Mediterranean plant that we that we grow in all kind of gardens already available in the market in Israel so you can get plants it's it, it's almost evergreen if you irrigate it a, uh, not over irrigate, but if you irrigate it in a drained situation, it will be almost evergreen. And um, this iris was cultivated thousands of years ago, and the Muslims like to plant it in uh, in uh, uh, cemeteries. So you find it many times in cemeteries. Um, but here you can see the wild populations in Mount Hermon, which bloom just now. I saw it last week in Mount Hermon um, uh, blooming. And these are very easy to grow, as, uh, as you know, like many other uh, Germanica group irises. Um, going back to winter time, uh, I would like to talk about the Uno irises, and you know, especially the Russian botanists like to call it genus Uno and not genus iris anymore. Uh, I, I would probably support this. Um, but uh, it's not accepted worldwide. And this is Iris Palestina, which is again, I would say, sub endemic plant of Israel, South Lebanon, a little bit of Jordan, that's it. And you can see it blooms in midwinter in January together with anemone, anemone coronaria, the one you know from the gardens is native in Israel. And they, if you look at the field on this picture, you can see them blooming together in carpet. So that's a beautiful iris. So unlike Oncocycrus irises, these kind of irises are really producing nectar in the flower. And when uh, Professor Avi Shmida, who is uh, studying uh, uh, pollination for the last, I would say, 45 years, he took us, our stu his students, to the irises and he gave us capillars and we, he asked us to measure the nectar in the flower. And we tried to measure in the flower and we, mostly we didn't get any nectar, <clears throat> but what we found very commonly is that one in one tunnel there is some nectar and then the other two tunnels are completely empty. So this is probably attracting bees which are intelligent pollinators and they are going through the flowers and uh, they probably have to delay and look for the nectar because uh, average they would find a tunnel that is empty. And if they are staying longer time in the flowers they are more effective pollinators. 
So Iris palestina um, uh, is, a, is a rather common plant. By the way, all the irises are protected by law in Israel. So you cannot dig them in a nature reserve. You cannot dig them outside the nature reserve. If you buy a land and it's your private land and you have these plants and you want to build a house, you cannot build the house until you sort it out with the natural authority. Then the plants are being transplanted or doing you have to do something about it. So uh, we have succeeded in Israel in protecting the beautiful flowers. So nobody picks these beautiful flowers. You, do, you wouldn't find anybody going with a bouquet of wild irises in his hand. It doesn't happen. Um, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's an educational success in Israel. Um, which I must say is surprising. Now, Irish Palestina is, usu is usually white or yellowish, as you can see here. <laughs> but as you go to the southernmost semi-desert population in the transition, though, you could get some bluer um, uh, population. And I will talk about the rootstock when, when I talk about the next flower. And the next flower is this one. So I was hiking in the Negev Highlands, which is a semi-desert. It gets probably 22 inches of rain average. So most years will be completely dry and then there will be a year that is very wet. Uh, and then I, I was hiking there in June and that's what I saw in the field. And I said, oh, what the hell is this plant? I have no idea what this plant is. And I'm a trained botanist. I, I supposed to know the plants, but it took me a really long time to realize that this is a small tumbleweed with fruits and seeds of this species. If Iris regis uzia, which is another Uno iris that is endemic to the desert mountains of our region, with meaning the Negev Highlands and also the South Jordanian mountains. And uh, <laughs> one character of this species is this beautiful white line at the edge of these wavy leaves. And after the flower is fruiting, it takes time and then the whole plant is drying the capsule is opening and the whole, the, this whole thing is tumbling on the ground, dispersing its seeds. I don't know, I don't think anybody wrote about this, um, uh, this the dispersal of this species. And what we are trying to do is write all this data in the website that we manage called the Flora of Israel and uh, its environment. And I will show you a picture of this website at the end of my, uh, of my talk. So Iris regis uzia uh, can be more blue or more bit violet. It's a beautiful, beautiful flower of, the, of a very arid, cold uh, region. Uh, like most Uno irises, most of the Uno irises are Asian, Central Asia, uh, Southwest Asia, and these are the last plants that you see in this group. So they are mostly Iranian. The only real Mediterranean one is this Iris Palestina. And another one, you, which you probably know, some of you is called Iris planifolia from the West Mediterranean, which is blue, beautiful blue. And by the way, it's very easy to hybridize these, uh, these two uh, species. Now, if you look um, at the root, at the, at the bulb of this Iris regis uzia, you'll see that um, unlike many other bulbs, they are very fleshy. There is a fleshy root cluster. And these roots are perennial. So they are not seasonal like in most bulbs, but they, are, they remain throughout. And the, um, uh, the bulb is absorbing nutrients. The bulb is absorbing water, but also the roots are part of this thing. So they also um, uh, keep some, some water for this. Uh, <laughs> this spectacular flower. Now, you, see, you can see also the bulb is covered by dry tunics so that also reduce the water loss from this, uh, from this bulb. By the way, these two bulbs were dug by a special permit for a research. So they were planted back, so don't worry. So in general, we, we don't pick, we don't harm plants in, uh, uh, in nature. So this is Iris regis uh, uzia. If you cross the border and you go to Jordan, then you get the Jordanian Iris regis uzia, and this is much more leafy, I would say, much, much more leaves, a taller plant with smaller flowers, and the flowers are more yellowish. Now, is this a different species from that? I would, I would say at least a different subspecies, and I know in Kew Gardens are trying, they are working on them for decades, and they didn't uh, publish anything. Maybe, perhaps we'll do it if we, if we will become impatient and uh, want to describe this as something else, because it is uh, something else. So if you look at the mountains of the desert, you can really treat the mountains of the desert as islands, as a biological islands. So you have these colder areas. And then the lowlands 
where these irises cannot grow. And then there is another area, high area in Jordan. And if time goes by, then they evolve into different things. And uh, maybe if we've, we've met, maybe, I don't know, um, uh, 20, 30,000 years ago, it was colder in the region and these cold loving irises were distributed throughout and then they got extinct in the lowlands and evolved into two different things in the, in the highlands. If we're talking about the, the Uno irises, I cannot resist this amazing iris edomensis, which is endemic to Southern Jordan. And for years and years, I wanted to see this flower in bloom. And I, it, it, was, it was always a matter of these 10 days to get this flower <laughs> in a good rainy year. It's very patchy. It's not so rare. I saw it many times in, in leaves, but you know, we live in Israel. So in order to go to Jordan, you have to cross the border and then to drive a couple of hours and then you reach this area and it's very dry. You don't see anything, but a couple of years ago, I made it in January and it was minus one degrees in the night, it was freezing, but with few, a few degrees, centigrees in daytime, it was very cold in the middle of winter and this iris was, was blooming. And I was lucky enough to see this unbelievable iris. Look at this undulate leaves, which is very typical to desert bulbs. So the leaves actually shades itself and then loses less water. You can see it in desert tulips and desert irises and other, uh, and other bulbs uh, as well. And you can see how different these irises are one from the other. Here you can see uh, a few more pictures of iris edomensis, another uno iris that is very uh, a narrow endemic of Southern Jordan. Um, I would like to finish with my talk, uh, uh, talking about two yellow irises we have in the region. And uh, one of them you know very well, and one of them I suppose you don't know at all. This is Iris grandufii, uh, which is endemic to Israel and Syria, probably also a little bit in Iraq and southern Turkey, but that's the region. And uh, in Israel, it really reaches its periphery. In general, in Israel and Jordan, the, the interesting story is that everything is periphery, peripheral. So it's either Mediterranean or colder flora that is disappearing in the desert or desert flora that disappearing in the Northern uh, uh, wetter areas. So this is the Northern element uh, that grows in dry, in, in uh, sorry, in, uh, deep, in wet depressions. Uh, and we, we've collected it. This, is, this plant is very unique because the rhizome is piney, which is very unusual in irises. So this piney iris is, uh, this piney rhizome is the character of this species. It blooms beautifully in yellow. And when we first brought a few rhizomes into the botanical garden, we lost them all in the first year. And why was that? Because in Hebrew, it is called the swamp iris. So the swamp is kind of a wet air, wetland that is wet throughout the year. And so we kept, we, we kept irrigating it in summer and all the rhizomes were rotting. So it needs a lot of mud and no drainage in winter time, but then it becomes, it needs this complete dryness in summertime, very strange situation. So Iris Grandufa, as soon as we learned that, we dry the buckets and the, and the areas in the garden, and then it, it, it's doing very well. It's really endangered because these dry depressions have the most fertile soil and they are used in agriculture, and it remained in patches uh, in, uh, uh, in the country. And the last one, I think you know very well, the yellow flag, the European yellow flag. And uh, uh, when I talk about endangered plants in Israel, I always give this example because we have only two populations of this flower and we are very proud to propagate uh, uh, this plant. Uh, the clump you see on the picture is in the botanical, Jerusalem Botanical Gardens, but this, <laughs> this one is grown in many other gardens in Israel, but in nature it remains in the last 2,000 most populations in the world. Now, if we tell this to the European, the European will laugh and say, ah, yellow flag, we have it in every ditch, you know, in London or Amsterdam or Berlin. And if we, we, we tell the Americans that this is an endangered species, they say, why are you crazy? This is an invasive plant from Europe. Uh, so you can see a single species that is uh, in a different status in, in three different regions of, uh, um, um, of the world. Um, I would like uh, um, finally to talk about uh, a little bit about archaeological uh, archaeology and a little bit about uh, symbols. So I'm sure you've seen the floor de lis, um, uh, this logo that is connected, perhaps primarily to French monarchy and French 
capitalism, uh, but this kind of logo occurs also in archaeology in our region, as you can see on the pictures on the left. Now, uh, if you flare the lily is the flower of the lily. Now the lily is, uh, is translated in modern time into lilium um, or lilium candidum, which is also sacred for the, for the Christians. And uh, it, it was for years thought to be the symbol of the lily, especially also uh, locally in, in, in the, by archeological, by, by archeologists and historians. But the French also say this is the flow de lis is probably evolving from Iris, uh, so the chorus from this one. I, I find it hard to believe because the flags are really reduced here and in the logo, the flag is really prominent. What I believe, and also uh, Uzi Paz, who is a great natural conservationist in Israel, we believe that this logo began in the land of Israel. Now, if it was the, 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 the this, this shape uh, has, has evolved from a lily, it wouldn't have been looking like this. It's obviously that this is an iris and not a lily. And to support this, this uh, hypothesis is to talk about the iris name in Arabic. Now, iris in Arabic is called Sausan. Now, Sausan in Hebrew is Shoshan, and Shoshan in modern Hebrew is a lily or the Madonna lily, the white lily. But since the Arabs kept the biblical name, Shoshan Sasan, we believe that the biblical lily is not a lily in, at, at all, but it's an iris because the, the true lily, Lilium candidum, is a really uh, a rare um, endangered plant of the cliffs of the far north of the country. But the irises, and especially the Oncocyclus irises, if you look at the, at the whole group of these eight species, you can find them throughout the country. So we believe that the biblical lily is an iris or even specifically an Oncocyclus iris. Um, so I would like to thank you very much for your patience uh, and uh, to show you again Iris Bismarckiana, which is probably one, one of the most striking flowers you can really think about. And also to show you um, uh, our website, Flora of Israel and adjacent areas, where you can get a lot of information. This is just a page of Iris atropurpurea, so it's also in English, not all the um, pages are translated yet, but we are doing our best. And you can have here rulers about foliage and blooming and fruiting, but also maps, not exact sites, because we don't want people, especially foreign people, to come and collect them, because there are many collectors. But it gives you the general idea. So here, for example, you can see that Iris um, atropurpurea has these brown dots, which are new populations that were planted intentionally. And there are light dots which, which are present populations and dark blue dots with old populations that are gone already. And then um, I would like also to say something else before we go to the chat is just to tell you that um, if you are interested, we are organizing uh, flower tours in Israel. And if there'll be a group of at least 15 people that are interested in an Irish tour next spring or whatever, uh, we can organize that. You, you can see my email here and you can email me freely and, uh, and we'll talk about it uh, in the future. So again, thank you very much.